Warm greetings and good evening from the Chennai Center for China Studies. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to today's institutional dialogue on the topic Party, Policies and People under President Xi Jinping, Challenges in the Coming Decades. The Chinese Communist Party was formed in 1921 and established the People's Republic of China in 1949. The CCP has since ruled over China, making it one of the most stable single party systems in the world. The party developed certain institutional features which would define its character for decades to come. The PRC has become increasingly assertive in its foreign policy under the past couple of years. This has led many scholars and analysts to conclude that such shift is directly correlated with President Xi Jinping's consolidation of power within the party. As the CCP commemorates its 100th anniversary, this presents an opportunity to study the CCP. It is also relevant and pertinent today due to Xi Jinping's policies on the domestic front and in the global arena. An analysis of the CCP is a key part to understand China's development trajectory in the post-1949 era, especially under President Xi Jinping. Today, we take a closer look at how the Chinese Communist Party has evolved in terms of themes, concepts, reforms, and especially under President Xi Jinping. To present this topic today, we have distinguished speaker, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale. Ambassador Gautam Bambawale served in the Indian Foreign Service with a distinguished service of 34 years between 1984 to 2018. He has been India's ambassador to China, Pakistan, and Bhutan. He has headed the Indian Cultural Center, Berlin. He was stationed in Washington, DC during the famous Indo-US nuclear deal. He has worked at the Prime Minister's office he has had 17 years of experience dealing with China in various capacities. He has been India's first Consul General in Guangzhou from 2007 to 2009. Besides China, as head of East Asia Division in the Ministry of External Affairs, he was responsible for boosting India's ties with Japan, South Korea and Mongolia. He is currently a distinguished professor, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Symbiosis International University, Pune. Thank you, sir, for being with us here today. Today's discussion is chaired and moderated by Ambassador Yam Ganapati, who is a former Secretary West, Ministry of External Affairs. During his three and a half decades plus of distinguished diplomatic career, he has served in many overseas stations, including former High Commissioner to Mauritius, former Ambassador to Kuwait, and former Consul General in Sydney, Australia. Thank you, sir, for graciously accepting our invitation to chair and moderate this discussion. With these notes, I would like to hand over the Flow to my director, Commodore R.S. Vasan, for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bala. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, special uh, welcome to Ambassador Bambawale and Ambassador Ganapati, who we are very honored to have with us today. And it's the second time that uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale is participating in our event. So when I made this request some time ago, initially I was trying to look at, uh, you know, having this event before the the centenary celebration, you know, which was on the 1st of July. But luckily for us, it so worked out that he was free on 2nd, you know, after everybody has already started looking at the speeches that were made and, you know, trying to analyze it from different points of view. But for us in C3S, it was important to have this analysis from our uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale because uh, he's an old China hand. Uh, you know, he's had a phenomenal amount of experience in dealing with uh, China including in some difficult periods. And he's been writing regularly in the recent past about uh, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, government, the Communist Party, the policies, etc. So we thought it would be important for us to look at the party, the policies, and the people under Xi. And what are the challenges? You know, we are looking at both the domestic challenges on one side and also the, the external challenges which manifest because of the policies that would be formulated, which have already been formulated. So all of us in the last at least 24 hours or so have been looking at TV clippings, have been reading various kinds of analysis from different analysts. And you know, what strikes out is that, you know, here is uh, a, a country that is determined to march ahead under one party system. And you know, that has phenomenal amount of, uh, uh, you know, impact at globally. So these are the issues that we would like to look at. And as far as the Chennai Center for China Studies is concerned, we decided that it's a very good opportunity for us to analyze the series of events that are happening. So we kick off this event today 
with uh, Ambassador to Pombavale stock. And tomorrow we have Dr. Amrita Josh, who is going to talk about the party. Thereafter, we have on the 13th a very important book discussion, which is on the uh, the, the political warfare, and uh, a book that has been written by uh, Dr. Kerry, and that will be moderated by Dr. Cleo Pascal of Chatham House. So you know about five six of such events which are there. We are trying to uh, take stock of what should we prepare for in the coming decades. We also have General Narsimhan, who is later to talk on the CPC and CMC interface uh, sometime around the 8th or 9th, and we'll promulgate this. So I would like to, uh, without taking too much of time, because there's so much that uh, you know we are going to discuss today, I'd like to hand over the floor to Ambassador Ganapati, who is a distinguished member of C3S, to conduct the proceedings. And uh, over to you, Ambassador Ganapati. Also, I have a request, which is that uh, Ambassador Bambawale has another commitment. So I'd like to wind up the proceedings by about uh, 7.20. So we will uh, dispense with the normal load of thanks and we'll request Ambassador Ganapati to both sum up and also propose a word of thanks at the end of this session. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Commodore. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be back on the C3S screen. Uh, for a very important event as today, uh, following the 100th anniversary celebrations of the Communist Party of China. Uh, I think yesterday was that great event, if one could call that. And we are particularly privileged to have Ambassador Gautam Bambawale to talk on this subject to kick off the C3S institutional dialogues on the CP CPC 100. Of course, I also see two other distinguished ambassadors who had served in China, Ambassador Saurabh Kumar and Ambassador Suresh Goyal on the screen. So welcome Saurav and Kumar, uh, Suresh, to this uh, meeting. Uh, I think uh, what one should also mention about uh, Ambassador Bambawale is that perhaps he's one of the three ambassadors who have done postings in Beijing and Islamabad, besides, I think, Vijay Nambiar and uh, Shiv Shankar Menon. Uh, Ambassador Bambawale, of course, was in Beijing immediately after Doklam and after the 19th uh, Congress of the Communist Party of China and was there during the first informal summit between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and uh, President Xi Jinping. Uh, the, uh, when uh, Bala mentioned uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale being in Pune, the Pune International Center had also brought out a paper uh, this summer, uh, in March, so to say, uh, entitled Strategic Patience and Flexible Policies, How India Can Rise to the China Challenge. That would be very, very seminal from a point of view of some of the aspects which Gautam Mamawale will cover during his presentation. Of course, the, uh, the curtain raiser to the uh, 100th anniversary celebrations began some while ago. And it was one of the most eagerly anticipated events and particularly the speech by President Xi Jinping. For me, not a China hand, of course, uh, who has done most of his uh, reading and uh, learning on the other side of the border in the Soviet Union and Russia. Uh, what was very interesting, the first thought which one saw Xi Jinping is his double uh, collared jacket, uh, akin to what Mao and others had done, because we have seen in recent times Xi Jinping and the entire Politburo and the Communist Party members coming out in suits and Tai. So this is not only uh, Xi Jinping seeing himself taking on Mao's mantlehood, but also seeing a continuity in the present from the past. Uh, as uh, many would have remarked, Xi sees himself as not only uh, Mao, but Dang and everybody else combined, and perhaps the single most important leader in today's times. His speech, of course, was reminiscent of uh, bringing and harking back to old times where he drew on the history of the CPC. And the, this is the first of the double hundreds, the first centenary, so to say. And, the first, and he mentioned in his speech that the Communist Party has realized the first centenary goal of building a moderately prosperous society in all respects and bringing about a historic resolution to the problem of absolute poverty in China and adding that China was marching in confident strides towards the second centenary goal of building China 
into a great modern socialist country. That would be in 1949, the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. What was very interesting was he mentioned national rejuvenation and China Dream has been talked of regularly. He mentioned rejuvenation 24 times, national rejuvenation 19 times, and dream four times. And of course, he recalled uh, uh, Mao's thoughts, Deng's thoughts, the three represents the scientific thought, but never failed to mention the thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics in for a new era, which is Xi Jinping thought. Is the party strong enough now? I'm sure Ambassador, we'll listen to Ambassador Bambawale very uh, attentively on that. But what do the buzzwords which every Chinese leader speaks of? Human community with a shared future, what does it mean? Does it mean China on the rise at the expense of everyone else? Does it mean bringing in, going back to the Middle Kingdom? He talks of opposing hegemony and power politics, but is China practicing hegemony? China is not intimidated by threats of force, never bullied, oppressed, or subjugated, but will never allow any foreign force to bully, oppress, or subjugate. Does it mean that others can be subjugated in the periphery? And if somebody tries to subjugate, of course, there's a lot of debate on the exact translation. I'm sure Ambassador Bambawale could relate to that, whether it's collusion course or head shattering and blood splurting out. Of course, uh, where does this lead India? I'm sure uh, we would request Ambassador Bambawale to spend a little time on Sino-Indian relations post uh, Galwan since last year, because that is a determining moment in our bilateral relations, whether the past 70 years were just a waste in trusting the Chinese when the trust was not there without verification. I think with these few words, may I now hand over the the screen, so to say, not the floor, the screen to Ambassador Bambawale. Gautam, the mic is all yours, and we look forward keenly to listen to your presentation. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Ambassador Ganpati. And uh, as he mentioned also, my illustrious seniors, uh, Ambassador Saurabh Kumar and Ambassador Suresh Goel, who are part of uh, this evening's uh, program at C3S. Uh, let me start by saying that I'm delighted to be with all of you at C3S. Uh, Commodore Wasson remembers, but uh, I wanted to share with you that I was uh, associated with C3S from the very beginning when it was established. Uh, I happened to be uh, in the Ministry of External Affairs at that time working on it. And uh, to the extent I could, I definitely uh, supported many of the activities of C3S. And I'm delighted to see C3S begin to flower, take off. It's already taken off, but uh, flower in such a wonderful manner. And the reason why I say that is because I think uh, in India, which we all know is a large country, um, you know, from north to south, east to west, uh, it is very, very important for uh, China watching to be done, not merely in New Delhi, but in other parts of India, because when you view China from different parts of India, you come up with different analyses, you come up with different ideas, uh, which can be quite uh, fresh, refreshing. And therefore, I uh, am a great votary for, uh, for people from different parts of India to be watching China, coming up with their ideas uh, and uh, with their thoughts. So I am a great uh, supporter of C3S in Chennai. And of course, I myself, as Ambassador Ganpati said, I'm based in Pune. Uh, so I'm a great supporter of watching China from Pune also. Uh, I think the perspective that you get is slightly different from uh, that which you get sitting in New Delhi, the nation's capital. Um, we are here to talk, of course, today about party policies, people under Xi. But I thought I'd you know, take a little bit of time to talk about the history of the Communist Party of China, then talk about the subject itself, about Xi, Xi Jinping, what uh, I feel uh, is driving him, etc. And uh, then finally close with a little bit about the India-China situation. And I can share with all of you that just earlier this uh, morning, 
I've had the uh, pleasure of having an interaction with some Chinese scholars in Beijing and Shanghai on uh, the situation on the Indian borders in Eastern Ladakh. So I had a good understanding of what they think and what they feel about the subject and the issue. It's, I think it's also very apt that uh, Ambassador Ganpati seems to have on the wall right behind him what seems to be a Tibetan tankha, but I may be wrong. I can't see the painting on the, on, in, in the tankha, but it's wonderful to see that tankha billowing behind Ambassador Ganpati. I think it's very apt and very appropriate. So uh, let me start with one point which I think many of you in the Chennai Center for China Studies are aware of, but most ordinary Indians are not really that aware of. I'm in fact quite surprised by this point. And that point is as follows, that while the Communist Party of China was founded or established in 1921, and we have just celebrated, as we have heard, the centenary of the 100th year celebrations yesterday of the establishment of the Communist Party of China. The Red Army, or what is today called the People's Liberation Army, was uh, uh, established, was set up in 1927. And very few people in India, at least at the ordinary level, I think all of you are aware of it, know about the kind of close uh, relationship that exists between the Red Army or what is called the People's Liberation Army today with the Communist Party. In fact, uh, you know, the, 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 the army itself was uh, just the armed forces of the party. And it was the Red Army which uh, fought the battles along with many of the political figures like Mao and Deng and even Chao Enlai, who were political commissars in, in, in that army. Uh, I, I think most of you know it, but I find that ordinary people in India do not uh, understand this concept. They try to project the Indian situation onto, uh, onto Chinese uh, onto the Chinese uh, army. Uh, they think that it's a professional army like uh, we have uh, in uh, India, uh, and which of course is uh, uh, you know under the government of the day here in India. But in China, it is under uh, it's an integral part of the Communist Party of China. So when some people say that the uh, People's Liberation Army is a separate, uh, uh, you know, a separate pole of influence in China, that's not entirely wrong. But you must also understand that it is an integral part of the Communist Party of China. And I thought I'd lead with this because uh, what happened was the earlier generation of leaders like Mao, like Chao Enlai, like Deng, uh, they were, uh, you know, very much a part of the army and a part of the party, of course. Uh, but they, you know, they worked closely with the generals and uh, others in in the in in what became the People's Liberation Army post the establishment of the People's Republic of China on one October, nineteen forty nine. But the leadership after that, so if you look at uh, the general secretaries of the Communist Party of China after Deng, I mean, Deng was not the general secretary at that time, but uh, if you look at Chiang Zemin, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, Hu Jintao, and if you look even at Xi Jinping, they did not have the benefit of this kind of um, uh, knowing the army, knowing the generals, knowing the uh, the senior uh, commanders of the army that uh, existed in the earlier two generations of the core of the Communist Party leadership. So uh, this is something which we have to keep in mind. And every one of these uh, leaders of the third, fourth, fifth generations, which is Chiang Zemin, uh, Hu Jintao, and then, uh, uh, and then now Xi Jinping, have had to build their uh, contacts uh, within the uh, People's Liberation Army and within the leadership of the People's Liberation Army. Now, as far as uh, China is concerned, uh, I'd like to make a few propositions about the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party based upon the history. And I don't want to dwell too much on the history of the Communist Party of China because I think uh, many of you know about the history uh, in fairly amount of detail. But I think the first point I'd like to make is that 
the leaders of the Communist Party of China, the leadership of the Communist Party of China has always displayed a willingness to take risks. And I think that is important because you can see it in their politics. You can see it in the way they approached economics. You can see it in the way they approach military issues. And you can even see it in the way they approach foreign policy. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about this point uh, that the leadership of the Communist Party of China is always willing to take risks. Now, uh, if you take a look at, uh, at the economics of China, especially after China uh, embarked on this whole process of economic reform and opening to the outside world in December of 1978, uh, you find that they were willing, the Chinese leadership, the Chinese Communist Party leadership were willing to uh, experiment with different types of, uh, of policies. But what they did was they would experiment with it in a certain smaller uh, area in, 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 in terms of geography uh, in China, within China itself. And then if that experiment proved to be successful, they would uh, then replicate it and scale it up to the rest of the country. So we all know that the household contract responsibility system in agriculture, which was one of the earliest reforms which was enacted by the Communist Party of China uh, after embarking on reform, etc., uh, was first tried out in small parts of China, including in Sichuan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was only when, that, uh, when this uh, uh, reform measure showed that it could work, showed that there would be an increase, uh, a substantial increase in productivity and production in agriculture, that it was then replicated and, uh, and uh, tried out uh, in other parts of uh, China, and in fact, then scaled up uh, to the entire country. And of course, uh, we know how that has impacted uh, on China's agricultural production, how it is impacted on agricultural productivity in China, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, this is something which we have to keep in mind. And I will tie this up uh, with Xi Jinping as we move ahead. But it is something that we must uh, remember that uh, in, in it, the leadership is willing to take risks. And uh, sometimes when you take risk, as we know in business, uh, big risk or high risk sometimes has high payoffs. And I think in economics, definitely that has had uh, some uh, impact on the Chinese economy. The second point that I'd like to make, and I'm sure Ambassador Ganpati will uh, find the parallel between what is there in China and what used to be there in the former Soviet Union. But the leaders of the party, they're steeped not only in tactics, but also in strategy. And they're steeped in tactics and strategy because of their domestic politics to survive in the Communist Party of China, as it must have been uh, in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. You need to be aware of what's happening. You need to know about how to take sides. You need to be aware about tactics and strategy. But the important part that uh, you know I would like to make is that this understanding of tactics and strategy, uh, which is sort of inherent in, uh, in uh, Communist Party leaders, definitely in the Chinese Communist Party leaders, then enables them to deal with international issues and international subjects uh, with great ease because they are able to uh, distinguish between tactics and strategy. They are able to uh, understand how tactics plays into strategy. And therefore, you find that the leadership of China and of the Communist Party of China seems to be very, very adept at uh, uh, dealing with international matters, at dealing with uh, geopolitics, uh, whereas leaders in India sometimes are struggling uh, to do this. And uh, as all of us who have worked in the Ministry of External Affairs and in the Indian Foreign Service know that sometimes you really have to take this little by little with new leaders, either who are in the who are ministers or who are uh, prime ministers. So you need to uh, sometimes, you know, even help them in their understanding of st uh, tactics, strategy, geopolitics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I thought I'd make that point because this is something which is 
the, uh, you know, all leaders of different generations of the Chinese Communist Party were steeped in both uh, tactics as well as strategy. Now, uh, the uh, third uh, important point, of course, which uh, is a, a, perennial, a perennial problem for the Communist Party of China is uh, that of legitimacy. And I think all of you know that at present, the current kind of uh, compact or a social compact, if you want to call it that, between the Communist Party and its people, that is the people of China, is basically that um, you know, that we will deliver for you uh, continually higher standards of living. You will get richer as we move ahead and as the country moves ahead. And in return, you must not ask any questions about the uh, single party rule in China. You must not ask questions about uh, why the Communist Party of China is in office, etc., etc. So I think all of this is known. But uh, there's the flip side of it, which I want to highlight. Uh, and the flip side of it is that the leaders of the Communist Party of China and the leaders of perhaps any Communist Party anywhere in the world, uh, then uh, they don't fear the United States of America. Uh, I don't think they are afraid of the Quad. What they really fear is their own people, because if ever there is a rupture in this kind of social compact or this kind of understanding, uh, then it is their own people uh, which uh, uh, who will turn against the party and who could uh, create a huge crisis of confidence in the party and in the leadership of the party. So I'll, I'll just make that point. I think it's uh, self-evident to many of you. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, legitimacy of the party is something which is, uh, uh, is always at the forefront of the minds of any leader of the Communist Party of China. And therefore, to a certain extent, you find that they're also a bit jittery and a bit unsure of themselves and unsure of whether a particular policy will fly or will not fly within China. And that, that uh, pertains not just to economics, but also to politics, to international relations, etc. So there are many commentators recently who have commented that as the uh, as the Communist Party of China turns uh, 100 years uh, and celebrates its centenary as they did yesterday, and they will continue to do it over the next few days, uh, it also seems to be a little unsure of itself. It also seems to be a little jittery of itself. It is using nationalism as a card to whip up um, support for the party. Uh, and uh, th this is something which has been commented on. But uh, the reason for it, of course, as I said, is because what they fear is not some other country, not some other military, not some other government. It's a uh, fear of their own people, uh, which uh, drives this uncertainty and drives this whole question of legitimacy of the party. Uh, and, uh, you know, th this is something which uh, I think uh, we need to keep in mind as uh, we analyze uh, the centenary of the Communist Party of China. Uh, the next point that I'd like to dwell on and talk about a little bit is about the increasing assertiveness and aggressiveness of China in its uh, foreign policy, in its international affairs, etc. And the way I look at it is that this is a function of power. So as China has risen, as China has become more powerful, not just economically, but also militarily, uh, it is flexing that power. It is begin to, beginning to um, want to achieve various objectives and goals. And I, I would even go to the extent of saying that even if Xi Jinping had not been the general secretary of the party, this aspect of uh, China's rise uh, would have continued and would uh, have taken place uh, irrespective of who was the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but having said that, I believe that Xi Jinping is a, a little more uh, um, ready to take risks. He's a little more, uh, you know, of a sehwag, uh, ready to go onto the front foot and hit a sixer than many other leaders of the current Communist Party of China. So uh, China's aggressiveness, China's um, assertiveness in international affairs uh, is, of course, stems from its uh, growing power, but it also is uh, something which uh, reflects to a certain extent 
the personality of the current uh, man in, uh, in who, who runs China, which is Xi Jinping. So his aggressiveness is also uh, being seen in the policies of China. And I definitely think that this new phenomenon of wolf warrior diplomacy, which I, in my opinion, and I don't know what all of you think about it, is absolutely unnecessary. You know, a big power doesn't need to, uh, a big power doesn't need to do or enact or enforce wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, it has to talk with a soft voice and that voice is heard across the globe. Uh, so uh, this whole thing about wolf warrior diplomacy, which is very unnecessary, in my opinion, is not really required of uh, growing and rising China, is uh, something which I believe reflects the um, the uh, you know individual uh, leadership of uh, President Xi Jinping of General Secretary Xi Jinping, uh, and uh, that is something which uh, we are going to see more of. Even though there were reports uh, recently that he has asked his diplomats and uh, to tone down, when I read that speech, and I'm sure Ambassador Saurabh Kumar has read that speech in great detail, I didn't find any uh, iota of evidence for um, this um, uh, conclusion that Xi Jinping had asked his diplomats to tone down the rhetoric, tone down the uh, you know, the high decibel volume diplomacy that they are currently uh, embarked on. I, I didn't see any uh, indication that he has asked his diplomats to tone that uh, volume down at all. Um, and I, I thought that was a completely uh, wrong um, conclusion, which many Western media outlets have drawn. It's more wishful thinking, I would believe, which they're trying to project on the Chinese. Uh, just a quick word here uh, about the Quad, uh, because um, you know, since we are talking about uh, China's uh, uh, international policy, it's uh, the way it behaves with other countries. I think uh, you know it has very clearly uh, stated its dislike for the Quad, and uh, I remember a couple of years ago, was it last year? that in an international press conference, the foreign minister Wang Yi said that the quad was like uh, the foam on the, of the sea, which when it hits the beach will just wither away and, uh, and uh, you disappear or dissipate. Uh, I, I don't think the quad has dissipated and Chinese dislike for the quad is becoming, uh, is they're, they're talking more and more about their dislike for the quad. And I think we have to understand the, the reason they do so is because they think that here is a possible uh, coalition which may really challenge their superiority uh, in uh, the Indo-Pacific, in the Asia-Pacific, in Asia, uh, whichever of those three uh, you know, descriptions you like. Uh, and therefore, we must understand that their vituperative um, uh, you know, language against the Quad is because they see a real threat uh, from the Quad as far as their uh, existence and their superiority uh, in, in, in Asia, in Asia Pacific, in Indo Pacific is concerned. Um, which now let me, you know, these were more general observations, but let me now come down to Xi and talk about the subject at hand, which is the party policies and people under Xi. And uh, the first uh, point I'd like to make, of course, is that she has understood uh, very, very clearly that uh, if uh, that China uh, now needs to move its economy from uh, what is basically a manufacturing economy, and it has to move to an economy based on innovation. And uh, this is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of money, as all of you know, being uh, invested in uh, new technologies and critical technologies, uh, not just uh, artificial intelligence, but a whole range of other technologies, because uh, the Chinese leadership and definitely Xi himself clearly sees that with an uh, aging population, and that population is going to age despite uh, China having announced uh, that it has done away with its one child policy, it is now encouraging a three children policy. Uh, but that policy is going to be very difficult to implement because ordinary Chinese people, definitely in the urban areas, and as all of you know, more than 60, 65% of China is urban 
population today. Uh, those people are unwilling with their higher levels of income and wealth. They are unwilling to have more children. In fact, most uh, young Chinese people are quite comfortable with one child. And this whole uh, um, you know, policy of now uh, trying to relax the one child policy is going to be very difficult to implement. In fact, implementing the one child policy in hindsight may prove to have been easier rather than implementing a more child policy, a two or three child policy. So with that aging population, uh, China is, uh, uh, you know, and with uh, uh, wages, etc., rising in China. Uh, she realizes very, very clearly that the, the economy has to transition from the current uh, manufacturing, the factory of the world kind of situation to a, a situation where uh, new uh, ideas, innovation uh, driven economy is, uh, is what he is wanting to do. And of course, they are, while they're trying to do this as fast as possible, I, I believe that she felt that he required a longer period of time to ensure that this transition takes place in the economic structure of China. And that, apart from many other things, was one of the driving factors which has led him to do away with term limits for, uh, for uh, you know, some of these important positions like the general secretaryship, the presidency of the country, etc. So he feels that he has been uh, chosen, he's the chosen one, so to say, to drive this uh, tr economic transition of China. He wants a longer period at the helm of China uh, for this and other reasons, which I will mention as we move ahead. Uh, and he wants to ensure that this economic transition of China takes place before China starts aging. And uh, that means it has to happen in the next 10 years. We are in 2021. It must happen in the next 10, maximum 15 years. And therefore, uh, this is one of the driving forces, one of the driving factors for Xi to want a longer term at the helm of China, apart from many other things which uh, we will, of course, try to work on. But having realized that China needs to make this economic transition, uh, what he has also been doing is he's been re-centralizing the economics. He's been re-centralizing economic decision-making power. Uh, which is the antithesis of the reforms and opening which started in 1978 under Deng. Uh, in fact, the China uh, miracle, the China economic story where it has risen to become the second largest economy in the world was driven by a decentralization of economic de decision making. And uh, he is now re-centralizing uh, economic power along with political power. He's re-centralized political power in his own person and in a small group of people around him. Uh, but he's also re-centralizing economic decision-making power into the so-called state-owned enterprises or the public sector undertakings, as we call them. Uh, and uh, what has happened to uh, Alibaba and its leader Jack Ma in the recent past, and you all know about that. Uh, what has happened to Jack Ma is uh, uh, is something which uh, is symptomatic of this re-centralization of economic decision-making power that she is undertaking, and which, in my opinion, is not going to um, hold the Chinese economy in good stead. As all of us know in India, which is as large a country, uh, it is absolutely essential to have decentralized decision making in the economics of the country if you want to make use of the energies, of the creative energies of your people. That is true even of China. Uh, while the leadership of the Communist, China, uh, Communist Party of China was important in the economic miracle that China has produced over the last 40 years, there is very little doubt that the very basis of that economic miracle has been the uh, productivity, the labor, the creative energy of the people of China. And this re-centralization of economic decision making uh, is something which I believe is not going to stand uh, China in good stead as it tries to move in this direction of transitioning from a simple manufacturing economy to a innovation-driven or an innovation-based economy. Um, a quick word in passing on, uh, because I keep thinking about it, so a quick word in passing about 
some of the people around uh, Xi Jinping, and particularly Premier Li Keqiang. Uh, what Xi Jinping has done to Li Keqiang is really uh, for people like us, that is myself and uh, Ambassador Suresh Goel, Ambassador Saurabh Kumar, and I think many of you, is something which is really, you know, uh, it's, uh, we feel sad about it. Because in the past, there was a clear distinction and distribution of uh, eco political power between the General Secretary on the one hand, and the premier of the state council on the other. In fact, most of the economics, though agreed to at the party level by the party center, uh, always used to be the, the focus. It used to be the primary area of work for the premier of the state council. And we had seen that right up till, uh, you know, we had seen that uh, with Li Peng, we had seen that with uh, Wan Chia Pao and so many other, uh, Chu Rong Chi and so many other premiers uh, of the state council. So what uh, Xi Jinping has done to uh, Li Keqiang, where he has clipped him of all these kind of powers and uh, made him just one of the other uh, leaders uh, under Xi uh, uh, in the standing committee uh, of the Politburo is really sad to see for people like us. Uh, but it is also symptomatic of what is happening in China today. I have asked myself this question many times that why the hell doesn't uh, Li Keqiang just step down? Why didn't he step down after five years in office and just give up? And the answer to that is Xi Jinping will not even allow him to step down because he needs him there as a whipping boy. So Li Keqiang is playing a role in Xi Jinping's uh, rise, in Xi Jinping's, uh, you know, uh, uh, his grip on the party. And even if uh, Li Keqiang had wanted to step down, he would not have been allowed to do so by Xi Jinping because that itself is a part of the whole process which makes Xi Jinping the enigma, the uh, ultimate leader uh, that he is today. And obviously, he is trying to uh, follow in the footsteps of Mao Zedong, who was as the chairman of the party, you know, the ultimate arbiter of the fate of the party and of China. Um, so I, I thought I'd make that point and, uh, and, 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 and move on. There are other people who are very close to Xi, but uh, frankly, none of them matters. Uh, there, are, uh, there, is, uh, there are a few people who uh, are the brains trust of the, uh, of the party and of the Xi Jinping um, regime, if you want to call it that. Uh, let, me, let me move to the military aspects of China. And, uh, uh, you know, for, for many years now, um, uh, Xi Jinping has been saying, and if you read his speech from yesterday, you will see this kind of idea and thought repeated that uh, China needs an army or a military which can fight. Uh, in yesterday's speech, he put it a little more gently by saying that China needs an army which can protect its territory and its national sovereignty, etc. But on other occasions, uh, Xi Jinping has used the following language that we need an army which can fight. And uh, I think all the reforms that have been done in uh, the PLA since uh, Xi Jinping came to office, it had started before him. The modernization of the PLA was always one of the four modernizations of Deng, but it has really accelerated under Xi Jinping. And, uh, you know, the setting up of theater commands, the, the kind of uh, new uh, equipment that the PLA and the uh, and all wings of the PLA are, uh, are getting is something which uh, uh, you know needs to be studied very carefully. There are other studies which have done this in in great uh, in great depth, but I think this is one of the other reasons why Xi Jinping felt he needed a longer span at the head of the Communist Party and the head of China, that he wants to see this reform measure, just as he wants the economic transition to take place, he wants to see the military transition through also. And yet for that to, uh, you know, you need another uh, 15 years or so. So it's, uh, this is one of the other reasons why, uh, you know, uh, Xi Jinping was wanting a longer period at the helm of the Communist Party and of China, and which is why he has, uh, uh, you know, removed uh, term limits for uh, himself, and uh, and uh, let's see how far it goes. But um, uh, uh, you know, the the reform, the uh, rejuvenation of China, 
uh, is uh, symptomatic and goes along with the rejuvenation of the People's Liberation Army. And uh, basic objective is to uh, bring it into today's 21st century and make it an army which can actually uh, fight and win wars. Uh, of course, as Sunzu said, the best thing would be to win without fighting. But, uh, uh, but in the absence of that, I mean, if you can't win without fighting, then uh, Xi Jinping would like his army to be uh, uh, an army which will uh, fight to win and where they will win with fighting. Um, with, with that, let me, uh, since we're talking about the army, let me talk a little bit about two other related subjects. The, the first is Taiwan. And the second is uh, the India-China boundary. And I think, uh, you know, I've been going on for some time. I'll wind up in the next few minutes uh, and then leave it to questions for a greater interaction between us. But uh, uh, as I said, I, if you can excuse me, there's someone at the door and I'll just take half a minute, uh, uh, Ambassador Ganpati, if you permit me, I'll just take half a minute to answer that and come back. Hopefully not the Chinese. Yeah, they won't ring the bell. They've just come in unannounced. Sorry, sorry about that. Extremely, uh, please accept my apologies. There's someone at the door and uh, was very insistent with the doorbell. Uh, so two last points, one is about Taiwan and the other is about the India-China uh, border situation. Uh, uh, about Taiwan, the way I see it is that, you know, uh, as we said, she is someone who is uh, really driven uh, and she has a lot of ambition. And uh, when you put all this together, then you get the kind of risk taking ability that I have been talking about. Uh, but where Taiwan is concerned, this risk taking ability is something which, uh, you know, not only the Taiwanese, but the rest of the world also needs to beware of. And the reason I say this is that, you know, she has this driving ambition to be remembered by history or to go down in history as a leader in the mold of Mao and as a leader who will be remembered in history like Mao and Deng. In fact, uh, my submission to all of you is that when we talk about the Communist Party of China, Mao and Deng are spoken about in a different lexicon, in a, in a different way. Whereas, uh, you know, hardly any one of us uh, talks about Chiang Zemin or Hu Jintao in the same breadth or in the same way, in the same manner as those two leaders. Now, she has this driving ambition to be remembered as one of these kind of leaders like Mao or Deng. Uh, and uh, when I look around as to what he can do to be remembered by history, to be looked upon by history in the same way and be spoken about in the same breadth as uh, Mao and Deng, one of the few things we can do, the economic transition, of course, is important. But I think that is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. But one of the things he can do is the reunification of China. And therefore, that leads me to believe that he would be willing to be a huge risk taker where reunification is concerned. Because if he does reunify Taiwan with the mainland, he will go down in history as a leader in the same, about whom you speak in the same breath as Mao and Deng. And therefore, I think this is bad news for Taiwan. Therefore, I think that, uh, you know, the rest of the world also be a bit careful and, and see what's happening. But I believe that, uh, you know, that uh, Xi in uh, the period that he is the leader of the Chinese Communist Party is going to take this risk of even an armed reunification of Taiwan with the mainland. And I'll stop on that point and uh, not labor it a little more. I think I have uh, tried to explain to you why I think so. And uh, the final uh, subject on which I'd like to uh, talk a wee bit and then end is, uh, you know, this whole thing that's been happening in the dark since uh, April of 2020. And uh, once again, uh, you know, you can see that uh, what she has done 
is that he had the option of continuing talks and negotiations. He had, uh, including in Chennai, in Mahabalipuram, uh, Mamlapuram, he had this uh, uh, summit meeting, this uh, uh, meeting uh, in Wuhan in 2018, where I was there in 2019, October in Mamlapuram, between uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi, General Secretary Xi. But uh, he had probably already decided that he was going to use a military option or going to use a bit of force in uh, our borders. Uh, and the reason for that is, of course, to um, apply some kind of military coercion on India uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, to have a quick resolution of the boundary between the two countries. Uh, so uh, I believe that, uh, you know, this is a planned, well thought out move. You cannot move several divisions of troops to the frontier, uh, along with heavy weaponry, artillery, etc., without having planned it. So it's a planned move. And what he's trying to achieve is he's trying to achieve a tactical uh, victory, which is, uh, you know, move his ground positions to so that they align with what uh, he thinks is the line of actual control with India. Uh, so at the tactical level, that is that. Uh, he's also uh, denied us area access. So Indian troops, Indian army troops are not able to uh, use some of the patrolling routes and go to some of the patrolling points that they did in the past. So that is a tactical thing. But I think on the strategic side, the bigger picture or the bigger message that the Chinese are sending, not just India, but the whole of Asia and the world, is that, look, today we are such a big power that we can do as we please. And, uh, and uh, they're doing it not just in the South China Sea, they're doing it on the India-China border, and they're doing it uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Senkaku Islands, and they're doing it in the Taiwan Straits. And I shared with you my worry about how Taiwan will develop in the coming years. Um, the question now then is uh, that are uh, the Indian, uh, 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 you know, response that, if there is no peace on the border, then the rest of the relationship will not uh, continue as it was. I think that is uh, pitched quite well. Uh, we have to uh, show China that there are costs involved of the military um, moves that they made in Eastern Ladakh um, and uh, some of the steps that have been taken, particularly the fact that Chinese companies like Huawei will not be participating in our 5G trials is a very important message from our side. But I'm a little pessimistic and I think that the relationship is going to deteriorate because you can see that the Chinese have other, uh, you know, other ideas uh, and there is not going to be a quick resolution of what's happening in Eastern Ladakh. Uh, a quick final word on how India, I believe India should uh, respond. Uh, there is, of course, the long term response, uh, which is that um, one of the necessary conditions, one of the factors which was necessary for the Chinese to do what they did in Eastern Ladakh was this huge gap or asymmetry between India and China, which exists today. And this asymmetry is not there just in economics. It is there in the military side. It is there in the technological side. It is there in science. It's there in education, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this huge gap and asymmetry which has opened up over the last 10, 12, 15 years between India and China. And that asymmetry was a necessary condition for the Chinese to be able to do what they did militarily in Eastern Ladakh. So in the long run, of course, uh, the answer for India is to reduce this gap to regain the eight or nine percent per annum GDP growth and then have that continue for a long period of 20 or 25 years. But that is the long run. And as Kane said, in the long run, we'll all be dead. What do we do in the short run? How do we stave off this challenge from China in the shorter run of the next few years, say three, four, five years? And I believe that uh, the, the way to do that is, of course, uh, through building balancing coalitions. Uh, uh, and there are three groups of countries with which we must consider such balancing coalitions. Uh, uh, and uh, one, of course, is the great democracies of the world. So the United States, UK, France, uh, Germany, um, uh, Australia, South Korea, um, uh, Japan, of course. These are one group of countries and the Quad is a subset of these and, and that's a, I, I think the Quad is 
uh, will be ha will have to develop as a as a, a good coalition the second group of countries is those who are in china's neighborhood so you have countries like russia and vietnam with which we could consider uh, building a coalition with russia i agree that there are problems because sino russian ties themselves are better than ever before as both president putin and uh, xi jinping keep telling us uh, but i think uh, we have our own leverages with russia we have our own chestnuts in the russian fire and i think we need to leverage those along with vietnam and the third group of countries with which we must consider or who we must contemplate having such coalitions with balancing coalitions are countries in india's neighborhood so bangladesh uh, uh, perhaps sri lanka uh maldives and uh, and bhutan are already there so uh, i i think that this is the way to go in the in the near term and i know that one of the uh, one of the criticisms of this kind of coalition building is that uh, it will compromise india's uh, policy of uh, what can be called strategic autonomy or non alignment but i think what is really compromising our strategic autonomy is the military coercion that china is bringing to bear on our northern borders and in order to stave off that uh, you, you know that uh, compromise of our uh, of our strategic autonomy we need to build these balancing coalitions uh, one last word india has not really had too much experience in building such coalitions uh, both diplomatically and this goes beyond diplomacy it it is something which Uh, our country our nation our people our society as a whole will need to uh, do together and uh, therefore in in any coalition there is going to be give and take our coalition partners are going to ask us what are you putting on the table uh, and uh, uh, and this is something that india will have to rise to india will have to it's a brave new world uh, but never before have we really had a, a, a super power on our on our borders and therefore i think that india will have to uh, build these balancing or countervailing coalitions in the short run uh, i am not saying that they will send troops to eastern ladakh to help fight us but they will uh, support us internationally and even through uh, provision of uh, weapon systems etc so uh, india needs to do this it's a brave new world Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, we have this huge power on our borders for the first time in our history is something which requires a fresh approach and a new approach um uh, end it with one last point that uh, the paper that was spoken about uh, which uh, the pune international center has done six of us have written it up uh, and this includes uh, not just me as a diplomat but we have had economists we have had uh, we have had a chemical technologist uh, we have had a business person uh as part of the writing group it's going to be converted into a book uh, pretty soon i think the title is uh, how india can rise to the china challenge and i do hope that we'll have an opportunity to talk about that uh, whenever it gets published i'm going to stop there ambassador ganpati i think i've taken much more time than i had uh, wanted to but i hope there is enough time for questions thank you uh mr ganpati sir you muted sir Uh, thank you very much gautam for this fascinating lecture i'll now ask it, uh, bala to take over because of shortage of time bala would you take over sure sir thank you sir uh first question is by uh, ambassador suresh goel sir he has asked uh, with regard to ambassador ganapati sir noticing she wearing the mao jacket was perceptive the polit is it like a political reversion to mao style control over the party and the country yeah no i think i think uh, ambassador goel knows this as well as uh, all of us but you know uh, if you look at uh, the past parades uh, on uh, the military day of china uh, on the pla day of china for example or on important national occasions the top leader uh, and this included hu jintao and chang zemin before him but the top leader always appeared in a mao suit a mao jacket uh, rather than the western suit so i think xi jinping is continuing in that mold of the top leader appearing in a xi uh, in a in a uh, mao jacket or uh, you know that uh, kind of double breasted uh, collar uh, whereas everyone else is in a suit so uh, for uh, for example the rest of the politburo standing committee were all in western suits 
and this was the this was uh, this was the way it happened even in the past so you can see uh, that in the past for example hu chintao has taken this salute on army day on the pla day from uh, one of these cars and he's been dressed in a mao jacket i think it's a continuation of that uh, uh, but uh, i i think it is also um, uh, you know it is also reminiscent of the fact that uh, she is more a leader in the mao mold Uh, and wants to be seen as that, and wants to have the power that uh, Mao Zedong had in the past, and therefore all that contributes to the Mao jacket. So um, I, I hope I've been able to answer that question. Uh, I, I hope uh, Suresh is uh, happy with that answer. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, the next question is by Kamudo Pasan sir. He has asked the issue with regard to the speech of Xi Jinping did not leave any doubt that China would continue with the aggressive policies. Uh, but he mentioning the steel wall of resistance uh, coupled with that there was again a commitment to take over taiwan how do you look at this statement and is there a time frame that can be assigned to these kind of threats yeah let me start with the taiwan question first because i uh, alluded to it and spoke about it in my uh, remarks uh, i i definitely think i think in the speech itself it they talk about the reunification of taiwan i i don't know if the word peaceful has been used Uh, but i i feel that the probability of a military reunification of taiwan is growing uh, and i shared with you all the reasons why i feel so so i i think that is something uh, which uh, xi jinping is going to consider in uh, the time as we move on i'm not saying it's going to uh, timeline i'm not going to say i'm not saying that is going to happen in the next 2 years or 5 years but i think it is also a function of uh what uh, china considers or what she considers what the communist party of china considers as uh, uh the um you know how american power is is uh, winding down or how american power uh is uh, is uh, compared to chinese power so there are many factors which will go into this it's difficult to give a timeline it's difficult to give a timeline of how long she is going to continue as the leader of the communist party of china as general secretary etc uh but i i think uh, one thing on his uh, because he is so um, you know uh, he is so ambitious and he is so uh, keen to be seen as one of the top leaders of the communist party that uh, he is uh, you know going to be able to he is going to take uh, uh, risks uh, and uh, we'll have to wait and see how that happens so i can't give a timeline but uh, it, it uh, is something which i think the probability of that uh, occurrence happening of a less than peaceful reunification of taiwan with the mainland is the probability of that is increasing day by day thank you ambassador uh, next question is by one of our interns mr douglas resosa he has asked uh, does the shanghai gang and the chinese communist youth league stand a chance at countering the growing influence of uh, xi jinping and his gang sorry i didn't get the uh, starting part of that question uh, uh, i'll repeat it ambassador does the shanghai gang and the chinese communist youth league stand a chance at countering the growing influence of xi jinping and his gang yeah uh, that's an excellent question and i think you know uh if you look at the uh, 100 years of history of the chinese communist party you will see that uh, threats to the leader always came from within the party um and uh, uh, i i think the threat to xi jinping also comes from within the party i don't think the people are going to revolt we spoke about the social compact and so on but uh, we need to wait and see we need to really study whether there is at this point of time uh, uh, um, you know as anyone in the party who is willing to take uh, she on maybe not right now but when an opportunity presents itself whether there is someone else who will uh, you know depose she or, or or take over the mantle of the communist leader uh, so i think the threat is from within the communist party of china and there are a few signals that uh, there is a simmering unrest there is simmering um, you know um, antipathy towards she Uh, that is only normal because he has put so many people behind bars he has carried on this anti corruption uh, campaign against so many people uh, and uh, people who are uh, you know related to them impacted by them etc so there is this simmering um, uh, you know feeling 
uh, that there is um, uh, you know some kind of um, unrest within the party itself but whether that unrest can make itself manifest that uh, we'll have to wait and see uh, but eventually uh, if that happens if she is overthrown it can only be from someone and some group from within the party so whether it's the shanghai clique or the communist youth league we'll have to wait and see but i'm sure as i explained to you even a person like lee ka chiang must be really boiling inside even as he continues to be a part of the leadership uh, group of this uh, you know fifth generation leadership um, but uh, but he must be boiling inside and must be wanting to take his revenge uh, today of course he doesn't have the levers uh, of power in hand which will enable him to take that revenge but who knows what tomorrow holds so uh, i think uh, i i can say that i mean all of us can see that that the eventual challenge to she if at all there is a challenge is going to come from within the party and if uh, she uh, doesn't uh, have a challenge from within the party and say 15 or 20 years from now he decides to that he's old or he decides to step down or he passes away uh, then by then of course the transition uh, to a new leadership you know the the orderly transition which deng xiaoping had put into place and which had been successfully done for several uh, generations even she had uh, been a part of a successful decennial change in leadership but that uh, you know that pattern that um, uh, mode of uh, leadership transition will have been uh, broken and uh, will not be available to the communist party so definitely uh, after she whatever comes will uh, uh, you know will be quite haphazard there will be a battle for supremacy amongst uh, several leaders and it will be very similar to the hua go feng uh, era after the death of mao so uh he has uh, you know ensured that that will happen by doing away with these term limits for uh, and the orderly transition of uh, leadership uh, that uh, deng xiaoping had so very carefully put in place um uh, so whether uh, she is going to be overthrown by someone else in the communist party or whether um, uh, you know he dies in office and then there's a leadership battle for supremacy Uh, there is going to be after she there is going to be a whole lot of turmoil and turbulence within the party and by extension in china so that that's something which i can see thank you ambassador next question is by kamudo vasan sir he has asked uh, what explains uh, this inappropriate behavior like uh, the old four year style of diplomacy uh, from an aspirational power like china yeah i i think it is this uh, you know i i think there is this um, um, uh, feeling that uh, china's time has come so as you know that they have done away with the dung dictum of hide your strength and bide your time uh, they think that china's time has come and uh, they they're quite used to um, you know uh, they're used to uh, protecting china's uh, national interests promoting china's national interests the only thing is now that they are doing it vocally and in, in at a high decibel level and uh, which in my opinion as i said is not really required it's uh, china is a big power uh, you know you carry a stick but a soft voice is enough for you to be heard by others in the world and for others to sort of uh, understand what you're trying to say so i i think this is just uh, uh, you know one of those um, uh, one of those phases where uh china is being uh, uh, you know being this wolf warrior diplomacy is something which uh, is reflected in the um, personality of the top leader and uh, uh, you know when you have a leader of this kind there are everyone else is wanting to uh, lick the boots so to say of the top leader and perhaps this uh, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy is an example of that um in my opinion very very unnecessary for china of today 2021 uh thank you ambassador uh, due to the paucity of time there is one last question that we'll be uh, taking ambassador how do uh, i have a question how does xi jinping abolishing the term limits affect the chinese economy on a long term uh, it, it is not the removal of term limits which directly impact the economy uh what impacts the economy are the policies that uh, xi jinping is following 
and uh, I, I, you know, I believe that uh, the re-centralization of economic power, which is happening under Xi, uh, and the re-centralization of uh, economic power in the state-owned enterprises, in the public sector uh, enterprises, in the public sector undertakings of China, uh, which he believes is good for this move, this transition from a manufacturing economy to an innovation-driven economy. Uh, is something which is not uh, really true because the innovation is going to happen in, uh, you know, when you let people uh, have their economic freedom in terms of coming up with ideas, in terms of uh, being free to think uh, up of new ideas, how to apply technology to, uh, to uh, gadgets, to instruments, etc., etc. So uh, I believe that the recentralization of economic power, which is happening under Xi, uh, is not such a good thing for China's economic growth and for the transition of China's economy to a innovation driven economy. Uh, but, uh, you know, she obviously thinks that that is uh, that I'm incorrect and he is right. Uh, and he has all the levers of power. I don't have any power in China. So I believe that, uh, you know, this is something which uh, which she may uh, regret as uh, he moves on. So it's not really the extension or the removal of term limits, the extension of Xi's uh, period at the helm, but it's his policies, which uh, I believe are wrong because uh, eventually what uh, drives China and what is uh, absolutely essential in the China economic miracle is the creative energies of its people who are, you know, hardworking, industrious, etc. And uh, even in this transition, economic transition, that would have been a very important thing to do. But by clipping the wings of a person like Jack Ma, a big message has been sent uh, to others in, in the country. And I think that will have a negative impact on China's transition, on China's economic growth, uh, on China's economic development into an uh, innovation-driven economy. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for patiently taking all our questions. We understand your uh, prior commitments. And with this, uh, with this we will conclude the Q&A session. I now request Ambassador Ganapati, sir, to take over for his concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bala. Gautam, that was a fascinating presentation, very clear, lucid, and excellent. I'm sure everybody would have found this riveting. And uh, it's been educative also, I mean, for opening the doors of the Communist Party and its future to all of us. Uh, I think, uh, and it augurs well for the first presentation which we have on the C3S to have begun with you, because nobody else could have done it better. Uh, you having been closely associated with the, uh, so to say, laying of the foundation zone of the C3S as GSEA not long ago. Uh, I think uh, just a couple of quick points, of course, uh, uh, I think uh, the speech totally detracts from what you said in the sense that when Xi wanted a credible, lovable and respectable China, I think uh, this was not what was presented in the speech. Uh, you mentioned Taiwan, of course, there's a reference to national, peaceful national re uh, reunification. At the same time, they talk of the 1992 consensus and that there'll be no brooking of Taiwanese independence. So obviously, there is that strong intent. Uh, of course, he also talks of modernization of national defense and the armed forces and that the country should have a strong military. So we better watch out and all the others watch out, as you rightly said. Uh, of course, today also marks very interesting de three developments. I think uh, one interesting development in the sense the Bagram Air Force base has been handed back to the Afghan forces by the US. So we'll have to see the sino access in that part of the world. There was no reference to the virus and nobody talked of the virus. Uh, of course, the speech did not touch on it at all as expected. Uh, you did talk of Russia, China. What is also significant is there was a strong, hard hitting uh, interview by uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister to the Commerçant newspaper, where he, where he talked of Russia, China and what uh, and even though he was talking of Russia, he had to bring in China as perhaps a, what he said, they won't, be uh, they won't be allies as Putin and Xi had talked of three days ago when they mentioned the extension of the 20 year treaty of friendship between Russia and China. It's been extended by another five years. But Lavrov talking of Russia and China in the same vein uh, has so many other implications and so many other 
connotations. I think that would be an analysis for all others later. But uh, be that as may, Gautam, fascinating, riveting, and excellent. I think we should all, perhaps, I don't know, you can't clap hands, but I would say, wonderful. Thank you very much for kicking okay. off this CCP, CCP 100 session for C3S by your presentation. Thank you, Gautam. And it was good to see you from Pune. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ambassador. You know, there will be no formal word of thanks because of time constraints. No, no, no. I don't Thank you to... so much. And uh, I you. hope we've stuck to the time that you wanted it to finish by. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador Ganapati, for uh, doing uh, the job so well, as always. Thank you, Commodore. So...